next on Viewpoint. Bob, I think the church needs to change its mindset about being a temple and start being a table. Are we too easily offended in the church? Her family lost almost everything in the financial crisis of 2008. Find out why 10 years later she says God has restored everything. And later, a Christian broadcaster shares his viewpoint that some of the messages in Christian music aren't really meant for you. This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. In our effort to be very, very diverse, the church, a lot of churches have said, just come as you are. Anyone coming off the street, come as you are. But a lot of, a lot of people get offended by that. And with me is Pastor Rob Yannick. And uh, should we, I mean, do we really want people to come as they are into our church? I mean, it's such a pristine, holy place. Absolutely, we do. Uh, we definitely want to do that. And I think it's time that we stop getting so offended. Um, there's a scripture in the Old Testament that says, Great peace have they that love mm -hmm. thy word, and nothing shall offend them. And we need to get unoffended in the church today. But there's so many things. I mean, you go back to the church. I grew up in the church in the 1950s. There's a family church. The family built it. And uh, we knew our aunts and uncles did all these things, but you sure wouldn't talk about it on Sunday morning. And they weren't going to stand out in the parking lot and, and light a cigarette. But we knew some of them smoked, and, oh. and the church was like, you can't smoke and go to church. Well, <laughs> we were um, offended. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Well, I, my first church I pastored in Mansfield, Ohio, um, we had a bunch of people that uh, started coming to our church, and, and they, there was a lot of people, a lot of them that smoked, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of them would slip out um, in the sur in, in, during the service and have a smoke. Is that during the offering? Um, most of the time it was, <laughs> right? Yeah. And they would, you know, smoke, and then they would just flick their butts, um, cigarettes around on the side. And so we decided, you know what, put an ashtray outside uh -huh. the church. But you're inviting them to smoke. You're inviting yeah, them to smoke them. I, I did because you here's get some feedback from that. I did, but here's what it, here's what it was. They're going to smoke anyway, mm -hmm. and they have to go out there and do it. But I was our 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 custodian was tired of cleaning yeah, them up. Yeah. So the answer was, well, let's get an outdoor um, uh, ashtray for them. And 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 they they still came. They, they still they, came. The important thing is that they were there. Yep. And here's the thing: some of them got delivered. Mm -hmm. Some of them put that addiction down. And some didn't, mm -hmm. but they still came to church, and that's what we want. I, Bob, I think the church needs to change its mindset about being a temple and start being a table. In the, in the Gospels, mm -hmm. the temple was restrictive. O only right. a certain sect of people were allowed. No women were allowed. Mm -hmm. No Gentiles were allowed. No sinners were allowed. And, uh, well, but the high priest went into the Holy only, Holy. Yeah, only one person went in yeah. God's presence. But at the table, gee, Jesus came on the scene doing temple stuff at a table. Mm -hmm. If you read Luke, all throughout Luke is everything Jesus did was at a dinner table. And he was always including and inviting people to come to the table. He forgave sins at the table. Don't you love the, the story where he's, the, 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 the parable where the, the master of the feast sends out invitations and the... The rich and the, and the wealthy don't come. Yep. They, they turn him down. They give him these, these lame excuses. And he goes out and invites the lame and the blind and the weak and the, the sinners to the table. Yep. That Perfect was, picture. Well, and that's, that should be the heart of our outreach and our evangelism, to go out and bring them to our tables. Mm -hmm. I think Jesus' number one method of outreaching evangelism and discipleship wasn't in a class setting. It was around the table with some grilled fish, bread and olive oil, and a jug of wine. Yeah. <laughs> a jug of wine. It may have been water first. We don't it know. may have been water, right, exactly. But what, what are the kind of things that and the people that are offended, what are they focusing on? Oh, well, they're focusing on something that Jesus is not focusing on. Jesus is mm -hmm. focusing on the heart. We, you know, we look at people's actions. And that could be good or, or bad, bad. Mm -hmm. you know. But I think we should dig a little bit deeper and look at people's hearts. You know, people struggle with addictions, Bob. Not because they want to struggle with these addictions, but because that's what mm -hmm. addiction is. They're struggling with it. And, and I think when they come to the church, no, we're not empowering them. But, you know, with love, mercy, and grace, they're going to find uh, 
forgiveness. Mm -hmm. They're going to find healing and they're going to find deliverance from these things. And there's people that accuse you of, of just sloppy grace, that everything's okay, come on in. And, yep. And what do you say to that? Yeah, Jesus was that way too. So, <laughs> uh, you know. You're good company. I mean, come on. He told Zacchaeus, you know, I'm going to go to your house for dinner. Well, Zacchaeus was a mafia hitman. Yeah. I mean, he broke your legs if you didn't, didn't pay. Pay your taxes. Pay your taxes, yeah. you know. So he was looked at. That's why he was looked at as a glutton, a wine bibber, mm -hmm. um, because he hung out with the people that religion did not approve. And why do we do that? And I mean, religious people, I, I don't want to generalize anybody, but Pharisees were that way. Mm -hmm. what, what does it do for us as a Pharisee, a pharisaical heart? I mean, if we're looking at people that way, what does it do for us? Why do we want to put them down or say they, they really shouldn't be in church with us? Why should they? I don't want them sitting next to me. Maybe they yeah. sit in the back. It gets <laughs> the attention off of me and puts it on them. Because the truth of it is, Every individual is dealing with some kind of stuff, some kind mm -hmm. of junk, some kind of addiction, you know, and they're barking about this person. So the eyes and the attention will get off their issue and onto their issue. So how do we as, I mean, if, if I'm pharisaical, if I'm judging people, I'm sitting there, I'm offended by who's sitting next to me by the way they you know, talk, smell, the color of their skin, the, the way they're dressed. How do I get non-offended? I mean, wh where do I start? Uh, to get that off of me. I, I think it starts with your faith. I think it starts with you and I trusting in God and realizing that God's going to deal with people and He's going to help them and He's going to um, heal them. And it's our responsibility not to be offended at why, what somebody does. It's our job. How about this? How about if we learn to pray for each other? <laughs> 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 I was going to say, prayer meetings used to be real gossip sessions in some right. cases, and, yeah. and that's, that's part of this whole problem, is yeah. that let's pray for so-and-so because he has this issue, and we're going to pray for him. He's not here, but we're going to pray for him today, and it becomes a, a, a gossip session. Well, I said one time, gossipers are backslidden intercessors. <laughs> Yeah. I think if we're yeah. offended by something, we need to view, look at our, heart, our own heart, mm -hmm. because obviously there's something within me that's not mature, that's not right, to be so offended at what somebody does. Okay, there, there's someone who comes into the service that really is a distraction from what you want to do in that service. I don't know whether they ride their Harley up the, up the aisle or whether they come in in, in hot pants or cut off t-shirt or whatever, it is, their midriff showing, yeah. whatever, the modesty's gone. It, it really is a distraction of the service. How do you handle that as a pastor? Um, I've always handled it with mercy and with grace. Honestly, I don't do anything if it's their first time. Mm -hmm. If it's their, if they're a guest, you know, the last thing I want to do is say something to them that's going to cause them to not come back. Um, and I'm not being liberal <clears throat> with that or extreme gracious with that, but I am being kind. And really, it's just all of us being examples. Mm -hmm. Now, there are those people who can't get past it. There are those people that... Uh, they, they've been in church their whole life and this is how you dress on Sunday and this is how you talk on Sunday and they're going to get offended when somebody comes as they are. Yeah. They're, they're, they're just, that's going to happen to them. Uh, is it okay if they go to another table? You don't want that, but if they absolutely can't deal with the direction of that local church, mm -hmm. it's better for them to move on and find another church instead of causing discord mm -hmm. and trouble. Yes. Yeah. But we're called to be holy, and we have this vision of holiness. Has that changed over the years with the culture we live in now? Um, I think so, but I think we missed the definition of it. I mean, there's only one that's holy, and that's God. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if His holiness doesn't dwell in us, it's really hard. We're human beings, not human doings. And holiness, <laughs> and I was raised in classical Pentecostalism. You know, mm -hmm. we didn't believe in fresh air. <laughs> you, you know, uh, women couldn't cut their hair, wear makeup. They weren't mm -hmm. allowed to wear pants. You weren't allowed to go to the movies because, right. you know, if Jesus would come back, you're going to hell. I mean, strict, Very strict. rules, okay? Mm -hmm. And we thought holiness 
was defined as not doing this, not going there, not smoking this, not drinking that. Wearing our hair a certain way. Wearing our hair a certain right. way, not wearing shorts as, you know, just, you know, and you sure didn't wear a beard and mustache because, mm -hmm. you know, that, that was the hippie drug generation. <laughs> and I remember hearing a message uh, at a youth camp that if your hair was past your ears, um, you could be lost. You, Crazy. You, if you die with your hair long, you're, you're going to hell. E exactly. Yeah. So I remember my younger brother was a, a, a rock star, Christian rock star, and he grew his hair real long. And he came to, to a church one time, and uh, uh, the assistant pastor grabbed him by the hair and put him on the ground and told him, don't come back to this church until you get that hair cut. Wow. I mean, think about the foolishness yeah. that religion has done to people. Now, yeah. mind you, it didn't... He, he was blown. He was devastated, but he was, you know, 17, 18 years mm -hmm. old. He could have walked away from church for the rest of his yeah, life, yeah. but he didn't. Yeah. He forgave, and he moved forward, and he's in ministry today. So, And so we're really looking at, I mean, holiness is, is not our definition. I mean, we nope. can't write it up in a book of rules for the church. No, but I think, Bob, we need to give people time. Yeah. We are so impatient. We want people to be transformed like immediately. That, immediately. You know, and if we can just get them to the altar or get them through that class. No, the truth of it is, even once a person comes to Christ, they're still going to struggle. It's a process. It's a process. Yeah. And I think we need to be patient. In prayer one time, I just felt like God saying, hey, I want you to know I'm still patient with you. Because sometimes I go, man, God, I know I'm 49. I've been doing this a long time. You think I'd, you know, <laughs> nope. Our He's aren't, still gracious with aren't me. Aren't we blessed that he is patient? Absolutely. <laughs> so if he is that way with you and me, we have to be that way with others. Coming up next, her family lost almost everything in the financial crisis of 2008. That is an amazing word to even use. Restoration is completely the season that we are in. That's coming up next on Viewpoint. We've all heard the stories of reckless finances leading to disaster, but what happens when you do everything right and you almost lose it all? Monica Guidry and her family face that head on, and now they have a fresh perspective on restoration. Monica joins me today from her home in Columbus, Ohio. Hi, Monica. Hi, thanks for having me. You know, from hearing your story, it would seem that you and your husband would be the last people in the world uh, who would expect to find themselves in financial crisis. Sure, um, my husband and I um, have always believed that you should tithe first, then save, and then give. And so that's the principle that we have always operated on. And um, because of that, God honored us. Um, I'll just give you a background. We bought our first house when I was 25 years old, and we were completely debt-free. Um, so much so that we literally had to obtain credit so that we could have uh, get a loan because we, we didn't have the credit. We didn't use credit cards, um, nothing like that. Everything that we got, we got it in cash. If we didn't have the cash for it, we didn't get it. Well, things, things seemed like they were going well. You're doing it by the book. God seemed to lead your family into career change. What happened then? My husband, who was working as a tax analyst for the, the, our, our state, um, decided that he wanted to come home and pursue his passion of trading. He's extremely gifted with um, stock market and understanding mutual funds and investments and all of those things. And so we agreed that he would come home and start trading from home. Um, and then the market crashed. And I don't know if you guys that are out there watching, but in order to day trade, you have to have a significant amount of money to do that. And that significant amount of money were, was our savings. So the market crashed, taking your savings, and since there was nothing left to trade, your husband had to start looking for a new job, right? My husband has two degrees. He has a, a bachelor's degree and he has a master's degree. And um, even though he had those things, it was hard for him to get a job right away. We just knew that employment would come right away, but it didn't. Um, the employment market wasn't that hot and we found ourselves um, getting in the rear in a lot of things. What, what was the lowest moment during this whole time for you? Yeah, it did get worse. I would say my lowest moment, and I will never forget this, was I had a jar, a, a small vase of change. And change was were pennies. It was pennies. And I remember taking that jar to Kroger up this road and dumping it in the change machine so that I could get money for something to eat for that night. 
And I remember getting something to eat and thinking to myself, I cannot believe I'm here at this store doing this. And then there was another moment when um, I remember there was, we had a can of manwich and it was just the sauce. And I remember taking that can of manwich and putting it in a rice cooker to cook it up um, because our water was shut off and it wasn't like I could wash dishes or anything like that. And I remember cooking it and eating just the, 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 the sauce. I didn't have the meat to go with it. And that was a very low moment. And who do we call? We, we would go over my parents' house or my friend's house and we would go over there long enough um, so that we didn't have to stay in the house because it was cold a lot of times and we didn't want our, our kids to be there. It was, it was a, very, a very tough, tough time. Well, you, you said you lost almost everything. It's been a few years and you've said God has sure. restored it. That is an amazing word to even use. Restoration is completely the season that we are in. That's where we are now. Um, we have since um, got back out of debt. I would say close to being debt free. Um, we definitely fought hard and long for that. I mean, nothing has ever been given to my husband and I, but I'm sitting in my home right now where um, we bought again and we built again. And this is only, I would say, what, four years after we lost our other house, which is almost unheard of. Most people don't have this opportunity like we have, that we have now. And God miraculously did this. What, what, what lessons have you, have you taken from this? The only thing that I can think of is a, a scripture um, that came to mind just now. And it's the things that I've obtained, I counted a loss that I might know him. And so I, I just think about everything that I've ever obtained over my life, whether it be a degree or a home or a car or my family, none of that matters. And so when he wipes all of it away and we have nothing else, the one thing that remains is him. And so what happened was I learned and got to know him on a deeper level. I know him now as a provider. Whereas before I didn't know him as a provider. I know God now as a provider because I had nothing and he yet provided for us. Well, Monica, th there are people watching this right now who are still deep in the hole from the financial crisis of 10 years ago. What would you say to them today? I would, what I would say to someone who is dealing with a situation and you're waiting for restoration and it just seems like that it's not going to happen is this. In the waiting, it's the most critical and most crucial thing that you can do. And while you're in the waiting, thank and praise God while you're there. And I know that that sounds oxymoron. It doesn't make sense. But trust me, when you do that, you're taking the focus off of your situation and you're elevating God to see past to where you need to be and where you're going to be. Trust me, restoration is going to come for you. Coming up, a Christian broadcaster shares his viewpoint that some of the messages in Christian music aren't really meant for you. The only thing that can kill radio, I believe, and local TV, is a lack of locality. That's coming up next on Viewpoint. Thirty years ago from this very studio, I hosted a show called Straight Talk from Teens, and the most popular topic on that show was rock and roll. And was it good for us? What we take into our mind? Is it going to affect how we live our life? And yeah. Terry Dismore is with me. You've been in, involved in the Christian media and Christian music. You were radio station program director, on-air talent. General manager, General on manager. air, all that. And I've worked in music other than Christian radio, too. I've done country, Ooh, full that's, service. That's evil. Big band. Yeah. But we, we'd, ha we'd fill this studio up with, uh, with teenagers. We had eight teenagers on orange crates. And then the studio would fill up from the local colleges and high schools because we brought people in that were going to talk about rock and roll yeah. and the evils of it and why if you took in all this stuff, it's going to trash your life. And in some cases, that's absolutely true. Yeah. What we take into our mind is going to affect what comes out of the, the, the experience of our life. But you were involved in Christian media as well, Christian yeah. music. And, and if we guise something in the form of Christian can we slip it into people's lives and sure? There's and, bad, and bad, bad, theolo bad theology. Bad theology. Yeah. 
and there is. There's, uh, um, there's bad theology in secular music. Not all of it is. But when we think of Christian music, we think of entertainment, or is it worship? Is it redeeming? Is it, what, what's been your experience? Well, I, it, here's some of my experience, is that I've worked throughout uh, the changing era of Christian music. I started in 1983 at a Christian radio station in Louisville, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And we played Amy Grant, the Imperials. Sure. Uh, I mean, Stephen Curtis Chapman was a new artist to mm -hmm. us at one point. You know, now he's, nobody plays right. him anymore. But I still listen to some of that music. And uh, for instance, Keith Green, a very mm -hmm. popular yeah, Christian I singer. I like Keith, yeah. Well, the, the, if you listen to the lyrics of his songs, they were calling us forward into things, mm -hmm. not to go back to Egypt. That was one of his albums. Right. Was, mm -hmm. So you want to go back to Egypt? No, we don't want to. Um, now, there has always been some um, cotton candy in Christian music. Mm -hmm. The fluff. The fluff. That's well, okay. Which is entertainment. Well, I, I heard somebody uh, a while back talking about well, some of it's just entertainment. I'm like, well, you know, I got to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. uh, God gave us a, a capacity for entertainment. He put it in us to be entertained. So what the enemy's done is corrupt it. It's not sure. God that's corrupting it. It's the enemy mm -hmm. that's corrupting it. Now, what does entertainment mean? And I heard a good de definition of that one time. To entertain means to be informed with delight. So sometimes we can be informed with delight by what's on uh, Fox News mm. or CNN, or sometimes we can be informed with delight uh, by what we get on Twitter. Usually not. not. Usually it fires us up. Well, the enemy has corrupted entertainment. Mm -hmm. In Christian radio, in Christian music especially, a lot of it is written for unsaved people or saved people that want to be comforted where they are. Mm -hmm. Very little of it is to go make disciples. disciples. But I don't hear a lot of what you're saying about discipling. Yeah. Well, um, uh, I have a theory. If you'd like to hear it, I'll share it. Go with right you. ahead. Here's the theory. That's what we're here for. I heard um, a guy speak years ago. His name is Eric Rhodes. Now, Eric is a radio guru, not Christian radio. Mm -hmm. He's a radio guru. And it was at a Christian conference, and he a Christian radio conference. And we were talking at the time about satellite radio, which has not made the inroads that everybody thought mm -hmm. that it would. And now everybody's talking about streaming and how many inroads that's mm -hmm. going to make. Well, you mm -hmm. know what the truth is? It's been around for several years, and it's not doing mm -hmm. it like we think. People still prefer uh, listening to somebody they know. So he said that they'd done research on websites, and they'd found out that websites have three main components, that if you meet these three main components you will have a very popular website. So here are the three main components. Entertainment, write yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Entertainment, mm -hmm. personality, and a sense of community. A Entertainment, sense of community. personality, and a sense of community. A website with a sense of community. Well, think that's about a, Facebook. Yeah, that's, that's your community. Mm -hmm. You built that community. It's entertaining because you read about people, and it has your personality. So mm -hmm. it carries all three of those. That's why that's popular. So he said, that's really true of radio stations, too. And if you can find a radio station that does all three of those things, you're going to have a yeah. great radio station. Well, I didn't at the time work for anybody but myself, kind of like I do now. Mm -hmm. And I got up and I said, okay, let me ask you this question. Are you saying the music doesn't matter? And he said, well, here's a dirty little secret about radio. The music never has mattered. Really? Music is a commodity. Right. Where can you not get music right now? Right, it's, I mean, you can, you can find it other places besides a radio station. Oh, yeah, right? it's ubiquitous. But, I mean, there's radio stations I don't listen to because, because of the music. Right. And there's stations I do tune to because, because of the music. So I'm going to be attracted there, but what holds me there? So mm -hmm. if I want to hear a particular genre of music, I'm probably going to find it on my own. For instance, mm -hmm. I like big band music. Not a whole yeah. lot of that on the radio. But I like uh, it. The 40s junction. It goes, right. <laughs> well, <laughs> right, but it's, yeah, it's on, it's on satellite radio, yeah. but there's not... I, a I can't, local station, you're not going to find it. But I don't want to listen to it all the time. Yeah. But if I've got a friend that's on the radio that speaks to me on a daily basis and encourages me and disciples me, I'm going to listen to that person. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I do that with podcasts. I've got a friend that's on the radio right now, and I'd listen to her any day mm -hmm. that she's on because... She likes to disciple people. If, if you listen to Christian radio now? I do, yeah. What draws you to it? Uh, usually the people. The people. I'll know the people. So it's local. 
Uh, some of it is. Some yeah. of it's national, and I know who they are, but I'm drawn to the people. With all the media choices we got, I mean, we got Christian radio, you're talking about streaming. What about, what about local radio? Is it healthy? Is it, where's it, where's it going today? Here's the important thing to remember. In uh, wireless communication has been around since the early 1900s. Radio, as we know it, has been around since the 1920s. Mm -hmm. And in the 1930s, late 20s, early 30s, the movies were going to kill radio. It didn't it happen. Didn't. In the 1950s, TV was going to kill the radio, mm -hmm. and it didn't. In the 1990s, satellite was going to kill the radio, and it didn't. In 2018, streaming is going to kill radio, and it didn't. The only thing that can kill radio, I believe, and local TV, is the lack of locality. Now, people don't really care where they get it from. They really don't. Mm -hmm. But if they know that you care about them, they really will. If they know you're invested in that community? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Now, we have, uh, I have a friend that runs K-11 Air One. Mm -hmm. Huge network, 600 and some yep. stations. And they try to do local stuff. They're not able to do it's it. It's difficult. Yeah. Um, we've got another friend that runs a station in Bell Fountain, and he's in the community. And his little station is pretty successful. Yeah. So um, it's very important that we understand what people are really seeking. They're, you can get the entertainment value anywhere. You can't get the personality, entertainment, and sense of community that you can when you're actually in the community. Gotta be there. Gotta be there. If you found this program for the first time, you may have been surprised to hear viewpoints like these. Well, we want to continue to produce programs on these relevant topics, but to do so, we need your financial support of people like you. Your financial gift to help us continue Viewpoint is greatly appreciated.